last time we were discussing about uh, um, a pipeline model where we have a bunch of uh, ready instructions and we make a selection out of them and execute them. So this was the pipeline um, that we came up with. So um, you every cycle you fetch a bunch of instructions, you decode them in the in the order that the, the, the compiler has presented to you, and you allocate them in that order in an issue queue, um, and then. An instruction may sit in the issue queue waiting to be issued. And when the instruction becomes ready, it takes part in a selection algorithm. And the selection algorithm may or may not select a ready instruction for each week. And eventually, um, the instruction will issue and read the register file or the data from the queue from its parents. Um, execute them, go through the memory stage if it needs, and put the result back in the queue slot. And finally, when the instruction comes to the head of the queue, it will write the result back to the register file and also wake up any dependence. Right. And we discussed why we need two wake up cycles here, why we need one wake up cycle here. Of course, uh, that's just one solution for solving the races. There may be many other solutions. So before moving on, I just wanted to touch upon a few uh, points. Uh, do you have any questions? OK. Um, so often you'll find that these two stages, um, are uh, usually not mentioned in the pipeline for the instruction. And the simple reason is that the number of cycles the instruction may have to wait in the issue queue is not determined because it depends on when its immediate predecessor actually executes. Until then, the instruction is not ready. So it's not like there will be just two cycles of waiting here. So that's why these two cycles are often not mentioned in the pipeline. The understanding is that there will be a, there will be a non deterministic amount of delay between allocate and selection. So that's what is implicitly understood. Right? Similarly, this cycle often is not mentioned. Um, the reason is same. This particular wake up cycle uh, gets essentially clumped here in this particular wait. However, many cycles the instruction has to wait in the issue. All right, so, um, so that's one issue. The second thing is that, um, so is the, is, the, is the point clear to everybody that there will be a non deterministic amount of delay from the time the instruction enters in the queue to the time it gets selected? Okay. It all depends on the selection procedure and depends on when the predecessor executes. Okay. All right. The second thing is that uh, last time we said that when the instruction completes execution, so the way the wake up works is that you will um, you'll essentially communicate your slot ID to everybody in the queue, and they will compare against the dependence okay, that they depend on. Then if the comparison passes, then you know that the result is ready. So. Um, we said that that happens when the instruction completes execution. Right. So that's not really needed. Um, what actually happens is um, you can do it much earlier. So I'll remove this because we really don't worry about these two cycles here. So as soon as an instruction gets selected, um, it issues at that time. And at the same time, it actually sends its slot ID to everybody. Right. So the point is that suppose there, there, are, there is an instruction which requires a register R, okay, okay, all right? Um, some instruction. And there is some instruction before it which produces register R. Okay, so writes to R and this one reads R. Okay, all right. So last time we said that this instruction will send its so this instruction will have uh, so let's suppose this this the, the Q slot for this instruction is Q1, this is Q2. Okay. So Q1 will be broadcast to everybody. Okay. And Q2 will have Q1 marked as producing R. And they will get a comparison. And at that time, you get to know that Q2 is ready. Okay. And Q1 
sends its thought ID only after it completes executions. Right? So that's not needed. What you actually do is, as soon as instruction Q1 issues, it will actually send this thought ID. And in the very next cycle, instruction Q2 may issue. Okay, so essentially, what will happen is that your, um, so if this is, um, if this is Q1, then uh, Q2 will essentially issue here in the next cycle. That is the RDS it can issue, all right? It will read the register file here, will read a wrong value, and will pick up the correct value from the bypass, from Q1. Okay. So last time, we are not making use of the bypass at all. We are saying that you wait until the execution is done, and then only you broadcast, okay. so that um, the instruction will read the value from the, from the, from the Q slot itself. Okay. That's not really needed. You don't have to wait so much. You can issue it in the next cycle, and the value will be picked up from the bypass. Is it clear? Right. So, uh, so these are the these are the few points that we uh, left out last time. Um, okay. All right. So from here we'll move on. that no instruction in the, uh, indefinitely waits. You need to, you need to tell the, the, because see, um, if it is written back, then you need to know where to read the data from. So that's the purpose of that data set. To tell others that the data is now can be read from the register file itself. Yes. Um, yeah, you can possibly avoid that cycle with some extra machinery. But the, the complexity will be pretty much the same. Okay, so this is the summary of what we discussed roughly. Each instruction goes through um, eight pipeline stages, uh, not necessarily eight cycle latency because there may be a bunch of cycles here which, which are not shown. All right? So that's what is implicitly understood. And also, there will be a bunch of cycles here from the time an instruction completes execution to the time it writes back. It may have to wait in the queue for a long time um, until it comes to the head of the queue. Um, so fetch, decode, allocate, select, issue, uh, register, fetch, execute, memory, write. Right? Um, and we also talked about a map table, which maintains a register to issue queue slot uh, mapping, uh, because it tells you which register is currently owned by which issue queue slot. Uh, that is, which which slot is which instruction is producing what register? So that does an implicit renaming. Um, it renames the same register to different queue slots depending on the production of the register. Um, we also talked about how to handle races between allocate and wake up, how to handle races between allocate and write back. Um, we also talked about memory renaming through uh, issue queue slots. Um, so just to, just to remind you, this particular process, um, we said that you may have, um, so this is my issue queue. Um, you may have two store instructions, right? store one and store two. Um, so you may have two, two store instructions. And the way the stores execute, we say that um, when, when the store is issued, so when do you issue a store? When it has the uh, value to be stored is ready, and also the register required to calculate the address is ready. Right? It requires two operands. Um, when both are ready, you issue the store. Uh, what the store instruction does is that it reads the value to be stored from the register file, as usual, or from other queue slot, or from the bypass. Um, 
and it also calculates the address uh, in the execute stage, but it doesn't really access the memory stage of the pipeline. Right? So um, it stores the address here in the queue slot, stores the value also here. Okay. All right. Similarly here. Okay, so even though these two addresses are identical, these two stores can execute out of order. These two stores can execute concurrently without any problem. Right? They will execute, both will compute the address, both will put the value here. However, the write to memory will happen in order when they go to the head of the queue. Right? That would preserve purpose. So this is implicitly doing a memory rename. So essentially, this instruction is renaming this particular address to this queue slot. This instruction is renaming this the same address to another queue slot. Right? So that pi is in concurrency, which was not possible. Now, uh, if we have a load instruction, let's suppose somewhere here, and the load instruction requires just one register operator to be issued, which, requires, which is required to compute the address. So um, what may happen is that um, this address may turn out to be exactly the same as this address. Okay, all right. um, so there is a danger that this load, if it is allowed to execute without any regard for this particular store, it may get a wrong value from memory. Okay, because the value, this value is not yet um, in memory. It's still sitting here. Right? So what we said was that the load execution is decoupled into two parts. So when it is ready, it issues, it frees the operand from register file or picks it up from bypass or picks it up from the queue slot. In this particular stage, it computes the address. And before it accesses memory, it takes this address and compares that address with all previous stores. Okay. And if there is a match, then something special has to be done. So in this case, for example, the value can be taken from directly here instead of going to memory because this is the value that you can load. Okay. All right. So uh, so memory renaming uh, is also done through issue queue slots. Um, so at the end, what you really want is uh, to have a very large issue queue to expose instruction level parallelism because uh, if you have a very large queue, the probability of picking independent instructions actually. But the problem is that large searchable structures are usually power hungry. So that's a known fact. Um, I cannot explain it here at this point uh, because that requires many other prerequisites. Uh, but this is a big problem actually, which is why, and it is a searchable structure because um, you have to search this queue for many purposes. One is for figuring out dependence, one is for figuring out load store dependence, and all other things. Okay, right? So let's, yes. You know, so usually uh, uh, the way it is implemented is that um, you you make a comp so it's actually a comparator, right? That's what you want to do. So you put as many comparators as needed equal to the number of queue slots. So all the comparisons will have to be parallel. So time is not a concern. The problem is um, the, the the energy consumption. That's the biggest issue. Okay, because you will be essentially accessing all queue slots and switching so many comparators. So today, uh, what people do is, um, the solution is that you distribute the issue queue to respective functional units. So essentially what you do is, you say that, well, um, I'll have a issue queue attached to my load store unit only. So that is supposed to be small issue queue, okay, which will hold only load store instructions. I'll have an issue queue attached to my integer AV, which will hold only integer AV instructions. Okay. So essentially you're distributing the queue in, in several parts. Um, so that the, the complexity of the design goes down. And also, a load instruction need not be compared against all instructions. Okay. You can only compare against the instructions that, that are relevant. Okay. All right. So essentially, distribute the search over multiple smaller queues. Okay. So that's uh, one, um, one implementation tweak that is done today in our processors, as opposed to a single issue. Okay. So let's try to summarize what fields we require in uh, each issue community. That might actually help you also remember what exactly needs to be done. So um, each instruction needs to carry the functional unit ID and the decoded opcode. Okay. 
Okay? So that has to go in the issue tree entry. Uh, because when the instruction issues, it has to figure out what to do and where to do that. Um, source register IDs and immediate operand. These are needed for reading the register file, and this is needed for computing with the immediate operands. Uh, destination register ID required for write back. Two parent queue slot IDs that will hold which are the instructions that are immediate predecessors as far as these two sources are concerned. So, who are the instructions that are producing these two source registers uh, before me? Um, Parent queue slot ready. So essentially, that tells you uh, when these two slots are actually ready. So there are two bits. Um, if both are ready, then the instruction is ready to issue. Um, whether you should read from register file or parent queue slot ID, this also we discussed last time. So when, when an instruction is written back, you can read the value to register file as opposed to reading from the parent ID. Okay, right. um, so one bit for each register source. And then you, you need a uh, you need space for storing the computed value because the value goes back to register file only when you write back, not before that. And the same field is actually used for storing the store value, this particular value. Okay. All right. Because the store instructions don't compute anything, so you can use the same field. Also, this is used for storing the predicted branch targets okay. because you have to figure out whether the prediction was correct or not. Okay. There's a done bit which tells you the instruction is complete, execution. You also have to store the store load address for this purpose. For the load issues, you just to compare this address with every store before it. Also, you store the computed branch address in the same field. All right? um, and also, you need a valid bit for this particular thing and an exception vector to figure out if the instruction took an exception or not. Right? So, this is roughly uh, the summary of one issue key entry. Um, you may require many other small bits here and there depending on implementation, but these are the main things that you require okay. to execute one instruction, um, wake up its dependence and everything. Any question? Okay. Um, for the fields in one register map table entry, you need a valid bit. Um, you need a value ready bit, which we discussed last time for resolving a race. And you need one queue slot ID. Uh, which tells me uh, which slot ID currently owns this particular register. Um, so an instruction is eligible for selection when it is ready. Um, and what does an issued instruction do? It resets the parent ready base, first of all, because this instruction has already been selected and is issued, so you don't need these bits anymore. Wakes up the dependence according to the wake up protocol, that is, sets the ready bit in the map table if the entry matches its slot ID and compares the slot ID with the parent slot IDs of all the key entries. So this one we discussed last time, um, how to wake up instructions. Um, there may be additional stalls, um, even if your uh, parents become ready because of interlocks. You may have to install and implement that. So that's, we, that's what we talked about earlier, right? Um, the load interlocks and all. So So the point is that suppose you are issuing a particular load instruction in the cycle, okay, um, and the next instruction depends on the load. So um, if that instruction issues here, reads the file, um, you cannot really get the data at this point okay, because the data is produced only here. So there may be additional interlock cycles that the selection hardware may have to implement. All right, so that's what it is talking about here. As soon as the parents become ready, it may not be enough to issue the instruction. Um, there will be other scheduling constraints. <clears throat> so once the instruction issues, um, it reads operands from its parent slots um, and or register file, as indicated by the read from bit, um, and proceeds to its function unit. Okay. An instruction completing execution says the done bit stores the computed value in its queue entry. Um, a control transfer instruction stores the computed target because that will be needed for figuring out these predictions. 
Um, a control transfer instruction also invokes misprediction recovery at this point if the computed target does not match the predicted target. Um, an issuing store instruction only reads the value to be stored and computes the address. These are stored in its Q entry and, and the done bit is also set, so that's what, that's what we discussed here. The actual store, that is access to memory, happens when the instruction moves to the head of the issue queue, not before that. The execution of a load is uh, more involved due to memory dependency. So just I just explained that here, so, I, so this is a summary of that. A load selected from issue checks, uh, for issue checks if all stores before it have their done bit set. Uh, if not, it doesn't issue, and depending on the issue protocol, it may keep on trying to issue in subsequent cycles. So what I'm saying is that, suppose when the load becomes ready, this store is not yet ready to execute. All right. So what does the load do? It has to wait. Okay, that's what this saying. Um, <clears throat> uh, if yes, that means uh, all the stores have already executed before it, computed the address, uh, th then the load issues, computes its address, compares the address and size with those of each store before it. All right. Um, if there is a full match, that is starting address and size, so a load essentially does what? It, sto it loads a bunch of bytes, right? So there is a size, so there is a starting address A, and there is a size. Okay. So a full match happens when the load finds a store before it, which has the exact same size, and the same starting address. Okay, that's the full match. So this is an easy case because in this case the load picks up the value from the store. Okay. It just contributes this value. That's it. Um, ties are broken in favor of the youngest store before the load. That makes sense, right? Because the load must be contributing the value from the immediate predecessor. Alright? So this is called load forwarding. Okay. Is it clear? Any question? If there's a partial match. So um, we're talking about a case where, so this is my load, and the store happens to be like this. This is the address, and this is the size. So the load overlaps partially with the store. So this is a very problematic situation. So theoretically, the load can access memory and march the values. That's possible, actually. So the load could actually read out read these bytes from memory and pick up these bytes from the store okay. to prepare the final final load word. Okay. But this uh, so so this is possible. Um, however, um, an easy solution would be to stall the load and issue it when all the stores before it have written back. Okay. It's much lower performance but much simpler to implement actually. Because this margin hardware it may sound very easy to implement. It's not that easy actually. Okay. Um, because I'm just talking about one store here. There will be multiple stores. There will be another store like this. So how many things would you march now? So this marking hardware gets more and more complicated as you think about cases. Okay. So, um, so often this is what the processors implement. So they will just let, this, let the load wait until all the stores complete and then uh, read from memory. If there is no match, the load proceeds to access memory. So this is the usual case. There is no store that matches, so there is no intersection at all. The load can be from the volume that you have. Is it clear? How load is this? Okay. And finally, um, when an instruction reaches the head of the issue queue um, and its done bit is set, it can commit. So that's the technical term used. Um, it's called an instruction committing. That's essentially the write back phase of the instruction. Okay. So what happens here? The first thing that you do is you check its exception vector. Um, and if set, that means the instruction must have taken an exception somewhere inside the pipeline. Uh, what you do is um, all issue queue entries are marked invalid by marking the tail of the head pointers. And the fetcher is directed to fetch a special trap instruction that will transfer control to the operating system. Okay. So essentially, you are removing all instructions after this particular instruction from the processor and preparing the processor to handle the exception. Okay. The big question is how do you now fix the register map table? Because the register map table has been modified 
in this particular stage and it points to um, I mean the status corresponds to the last instruction allocated here. How do you fix the table now? It has to now it has to roll back to point to uh, this particular instruction, whatever the state was at that point. So um, this is my this is the state of one issue inventory. So this much data I have. Can I recover the map table from this? Is there a problem here? What we're talking about? An instruction is taking an exception. The map table has run much farther ahead. Actually, now you have to roll it back to this point. Can I recover it from from these states? For each instruction in the queue, I, I know all these things. So each, uh, so this is my map table. Each entry has three things. So um, for this register, register R, let's say, it tells me which slot ID was the one to produce this register last, the last instruction to produce this register. This this particular slot. Okay. This field tells me if this instruction is already executed and the register is ready in the slot ID. The value is ready in the slot ID. And this one tells me this bit if this particular map is at all valid or not. And to remind you, this bit is turned off when the slot writes back. Okay, all right. Provided this slot is still there in this register's map. So how do I now Recover this entire map table to a state of the accepting instruction. So when the accepting instruction was allocated, I want to roll back to, the, to that state. So can I do one thing? So this ready bit here, right? Um, it is zero when the value is not ready in the slot, right? And um, otherwise, it's one, right? When it executes. So can I can I set all these bits to one? The only instruction that's currently in the head of the queue is the accepting instruction. Everything after it will be killed. They will be fetched again and be. What will be the state of the valid bit? So forget about this one. I'm just asking about these two states. What should they be after you recover? Sorry, both zero? Sorry, what? Zero. Which one is zero? Uh, R. R should be zero? Yeah. What about the valid bit? Zero? Why? So that it doesn't read from the from the Right, exactly. So the point is that um, when the accepting instruction, when the exception handler starts, all the values produced by the program till this point are all in the register file, right? There's nothing in the queue at this point. So this map table essentially has no meaning, right? So I can mark everything to zero all the valid bits and I don't have to worry about anything else in this table. There is no map that is valid at this point. Is it clear? That I can just clear this valid bit column and I'm done. So when the when the exception handler starts, it will re-establish all the mappings for the Okay? Clear? Or not clear?
What was the purpose of the map table? The purpose was that when an instruction comes, which needs to read from register R, it will know which, what its parent is actually. Okay. So now there is no parent actually. Everything is written back to the register file. It's like a reorder pipeline, the one that we discussed. Okay. So I can just clear this bit and be done. We don't have to do anything else. <coughs> Okay, um, so yeah, so this is easy, um, fixing the register map table. Um, okay, so that's the exception check. Um, assuming that there is no exception, a store instruction is sent to memory at this time, when the instruction commits. Um, a control transfer instruction updates the relevant predictors. It's the time to update the predictors because you know the correct outcome and you know that this instruction is um, about to commit. Okay, all right. Value producing instructions write the results back to the destination registers. Okay. Uh, so it resets the valid bit in the map table if its slot ID matches the entry of the destination register in the map table. Compares its slot ID with parent slot IDs of all Q entries and toggles the rate from bit accordingly. So these are this is the wake up stage that we talked about, uh, clubbed with the write back. Okay. Any questions? So that's the commit protocol. So that's what happens at commit stage. So how complex is this implementation? Uh, number of comparators depend on size of issue queue, issue width, and commit width. Uh, why is that? So um, issue width is the number of instructions that you issue in a cycle, right? And each instruction will send its QID to everybody for comparison, all right? And everybody will make two comparisons, right? Because they may have two dependents. So um, number of comparisons in this particular wake up stage is two times issue width times the length of the queue, all right? Okay. And when the instruction commits, it will have to do one more wake up than we talked about, right? So that depends on the commit width. How many instructions I can commit in a cycle, okay? Um, so that's again twice commit width times the number of key slots. So two sets of comparators, one enabled during issue and one during commit, cause inconvenience. Um, so you need a better solution that can eliminate one of these. All right. um, and why we need these two? It arises due to two possible places of finding a value. Right? Apparently the, a value may be in the register file or maybe in the issue queue entry depending on the state of the instruction that produces a value. Right. Um, so you need to merge these, these using some protocol, and uh, that's what today's processors do. Um, these to register in a mean implement into the, today's processors. So that's what we discuss very soon. How exactly you merge these two things into a single structure. Okay. Uh, then you can get rid of one, of one set of comparators. Particularly this one, you don't really need. At the time of commit, there is no need to wake up at <coughs> What dictates issue width? Um, issue width is limited by the number and mix of functional limits. Um, register file read ports, data memory read ports. We discussed this last time. Um, commit width is limited by register file write ports and data memory write ports. This also discussed last time. <coughs> so one small thing that is left uh, in this processor is how do you recover from branch misconceptions? That's one small thing that we need to discuss. Um, so, uh, just to remind you, we said that um, you invoke this when a branch instruction completes execution. Um, it invokes a misprediction recovery uh, at this point if the computer target does not match the predicted target. Okay, so, when the branch instruction completes execution, you have both, you compare them. If they don't match, you know that something has gone wrong. So how do we recover? So that's easy to handle if delayed until commit, just like exceptions. You can say that, well, why do you have to recover immediately? Let's wait until the branch commits. So then it looks exactly like an exception. You can say that, well, the branch instruction is taking an exception. So I'll just do the same thing as, uh, as I was doing for handling exceptions. Um, it's lower performance because the commit of a branch 
may get delayed due to other long latency or unrelated instructions. Because remember that a branch can commit only which comes to the head of the queue. There may be other instructions sitting here before the branch, which may take a long time to complete, which are completely unrelated. Okay. Um, and essentially, if you if you delay so much, the processor continues to fetch along the wrong path, and all those instructions will have to be thrown away. So this is not really done. Okay, this is not acceptable at all. The main point here is that for exception, this is acceptable because exceptions are rare. But this is this may not be rare because it's not really the property of an application. This is the property of the branch predictor, how smart it is. If I do not have a good branch predictor, this is going to be very frequent, this particular event. Okay. So um, we'd like to handle it as soon as misprediction is discovered. Um, and the thing to observe is, so essentially you're talking about a situation where um, <coughs> let's say we have a branch instruction here, uh, which has been issued and has executed. And um, you find that this branch is misprinted. So the predicted outcome doesn't match the computed target. So the point is that first thing to observe is several instructions after it may have completed execution, but still not completed. So there may be several instructions here that have already completed, but have not yet you know, uh, committed, of course, because they cannot commit before the branch. Okay. Several instructions before it may not have even issued it yet. So here. There may be several instructions which may be waiting for some instruction here. Okay. They, may, they, may be depend, they may be dependent on some instruction here. They haven't yet issued it. Okay, so given this particular state of the issue queue, we would like to recover from this, this prediction. Okay. So the first thing to notice is that we are not worried about the instructions before the branch because they are correct. We are worried about the instructions after the branch because they are not correct actually. Okay. They are on the wrongly predicted path. So what you do, you invalidate all instructions after the branch by bringing the tail pointer of the queue forward. Okay. So you bring the tail pointer, it was probably here, you bring it up here. So that the next instruction will be allocated here so that these will get overwritten. They will never commit actually. Okay. All right. um, redirect the fetcher to the correct PC, all right. And fix the register map from, from a checkpoint. So this is very different from the way we uh, recover the register map in case of an exception. So except this point, is it clear? The rest of the things, what I do, okay. So here, what I really need to do, is not really going to be very easy because um, now I, I really cannot just flash clear the valid bit and be done. I have to bring the register map up to the point what it was when the branch was allocated, okay, right? And there is no easy way of doing it, actually. Um, so one solution here, is that for each branch instruction, whenever you allocate a branch instruction, you make a copy of the map table. Okay. So essentially that requires extra storage. And that puts a limit on how many branch instruction um, I can keep in the queue. Okay. Because every branch instruction now comes with a checkpoint. Because there is a chance that this branch instruction may misread. Okay. So often the processors talk about a certain number of branches that you can the maximum number of branches that can remain unresolved. For example, um, if you say that I can have only 20 branches outstanding in the queue, that means whenever the decoder decodes the 21st branch, the picture is going to stall here. It cannot proceed any further. Okay, because there is no space for storing the checkpoint for this particular branch instruction. Okay. So essentially the checkpoint contains a copy of this table. That's it. Okay. And whenever a branch mispredicts, I take that copy copy the whole thing here, okay. so that I get back the map that I needed. Okay. Is it clear to everybody how I recover the instrument? map? Is there any other way of recovering which doesn't require a checkpoint? So this is what I have in these two entries. So currently my tail pointer is here. I have allocated up to this point. And that means I need to um, 
So my map table currently points to this particular state. I need to bring it back here. Can I recover it from the state of the instructions? Let's take the last instruction here. Okay. Right? So it tells me that uh, it writes to certain register ID that's stored in the queue entry. All right? That's a register 20. Which means if I go and look at the 20th row of this table, I must find this particular Q slot ID there. Okay? That's what it means essentially. Okay. So by recovering what I need to, to make a progress, I need to know which was the previous entry that wrote to register 20. So then what I can do is, I can change that 20th row to this one, and then incrementally move it up. Okay. I can do that. Right? So this requires a search, unfortunately. For example, register 20, I have to move, it, move forward and find out which was the previous instruction that wrote to 20. Okay. Can I improve that? Sorry, say Right, exactly. So when this instruction was allocated, what was the content of the 20th row? It was the previous slot ID, right? I just need to remember it here in this entry. So I can quickly then recover it. But it still takes time because you have to sequentially walk this particular key up to this point. You take one entry at a time and unmap. It cannot be as fast as recovering from checkpoint. But it reads you off the checkpoint completely. You can just recover it from the queue states. You don't need any other extra storage. Okay, all right. So there are two mechanisms, but today most processors actually do the checkpointing uh, because of the speed. Okay. Branch misprediction is often very frequent, depending on the nature of the branch. Um, and if the branch is towards the head of the queue, uh, you may have to walk the queue for a long time. Okay. There will be a large number of instructions already allocated here. So that question. Okay. So um, that's about our uh, single issue queue uh, uh, processor, which essentially does out of order execution. Okay. That's what we're seeing. It executes instructions out of the out of the program order. Um, it gives you concurrency in terms of uh, allowing you to execute multiple instructions in a cycle. Okay. So any question on this? So what we'll do is now, we'll drag back in history a little bit. Okay. I'll try to see what people used to do in early years uh, when the sophisticated hardware were not there. Um, so the earliest implementation of this idea was in terms of scoreboard. Um, the first introduced in uh, uh, CDC 6600. So that's a machine from uh, Control Data Corporation. So that's what this stands for. <coughs> um, so they had a similar structure like our issue queue, which they called a scoreboard. Okay. And the name comes from the fact that um, essentially each instruction gets a score, which signifies whether the instruction is ready to go on. Um, so it handles raw hazards dynamically, just the way we have discussed, exactly the same actually. It keeps track of the dependence. Um, it stalls on war and war hazards, so the decoder actually can figure out if there could be a possibility of any of these happening. And if there is a chance, then the decoder would actually you know, introduce interlock stops until that is resolved. And we discuss how to do this using a ship register and all. Okay, all right? The issue was still in order. You could not actually jumble instruction order. Here, we have already discussed in our, in our single issue queue model is that you can, you can issue any ready instruction, restrict to the order. And we enforce the order at the time of commit. Okay, right? But here, um, even execution was in order. The scoreboard determines when an instruction can execute based on operand availability. Um, war hazards stall the issue unit. War hazards are detected during write back and completed instructions are delayed. So the, the processor, uh, previously we saw that war hazards can be written in decoder, but here they delayed until write back. Okay. So the instructions are allowed to go, and when they come to the write back stage, they detect the war hazards. And 
the complete instructions are delayed. So they have a buffer there where they can put the results and until the hazard is resolved, they can go. So the book talks about an example in detail. So you can look at that actually, how the scoreboard actually works. Um, but anyway, I, I don't want to spend much time on this because this is not really what is done today in any part. So you can read the book. The book gives an example of uh, how, the, how the scoreboard works. And then um, what we have discussed in this single issue queue model is essentially the Tomasillo's algorithm. That also we just, we, I mentioned last time. Um, so Robert Tomasillo was uh, an IBM engineer. And uh, he came up with this algorithm when designing IBM 360 machine. So again, um, the first incarnation of Tomasillo's algorithm was very different from what we have discussed here. So um, again, the book goes in great detail discussing um, what that algorithm was along with examples. So here's a summary of that. Again, I won't go into detail because this is not really what is done in any concept today. Okay. Um, so um, <clears throat> it distributes the scoreboard to respective functional units. Uh, these are known as reservation stations. So it already does the distribution as opposed to having a single issue. Here, all right? And these distributed sections are called reservation stations. Essentially, an instruction can go and occupy a reservation station, waiting for the parent to complete. It resolves the name dependencies by using the reservation station entries, just like our queue slot entries. After an instruction is registered in a reservation station, all dependencies generated by this instruction are mentioned in terms of the reservation station IDs, just like our queue slot IDs. Okay, all right. <coughs> Write back register file and cache must still be in order, just like what we have discussed. Uh, pending results can be held in reservation station entry or a future file. So this is just like what we did on in our, our issue queue. Bypass network takes the form of a common bus. So this is just a specific implementation detail of the bypass network, how you implement it actually. Um, all launch results must compare all pending instruction sources. So that's exactly what we have discussed also. Um, the retirement register file of uh, P6 microarchitecture is very similar. So we'll discuss P6 very soon. Uh, we are almost ready to discuss that. So um, essentially, what P6 had was um, they had a, they had a very similar thing like our single issue queue, but they did not issue from this queue. Actually. They had a separate structure for that. So they had a, they had they used this queue for holding the results only of computed instructions, which haven't yet written to the register file. So that, that was called a retirement register file. So they had two register files. One was the main file, other one was the RRF. And RRF values will be transferred to the main file when instruction <coughs> okay. So we'll discuss P6 in more detail very soon. But just wanted to mention it here because it's very similar. Okay, so um, one more thing about um, uh, control prediction. So, um, if you look at the Tomasillo's algorithm uh, carefully, or whatever we have done, carefully, what we are doing essentially is that uh, we are looking for instructions that are independent, essentially, independent of their predecessors, and they are themselves independent of each other, so that they can execute concurrently. Right? So that's essentially what we are trying to do. So the question is, can we apply the same idea for resolving branches? So let me try to, try to explain what I mean here. You essentially look for instructions that are control independent of the current branch at hand. So let's take an example. So this one will translate to a branch instruction. Execution of this and this are control dependent on this branch. But this is not. Okay, all right? So that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Is it possible to skip over these instructions and start fetching from here? Later we'll fill up the gap when the branch resolves, either from here or from here. Okay. So that's essentially uh, uh, that that's essentially similar to Tomasula's algorithm for control independent. So, um, so this is just for your, you know, just just for your. Uh, uh, if you want to think, you can think about them. Uh, here are some of the issues that will come up. Um, 
First question is how do you figure out what instructions are controlled independent of a branch? Okay. Um, so here you have a branch. This is control independent, right? The question is, um, is it a static thing or it changes over time? That is a control independent set of instructions for a branch. Will that set change over time or is it a fixed set of instructions? If it's a fixed set, then that's, it. that's good, right? Because once I have detected the set, I'm done. And I can remember the set somewhere. Whenever I hit the branch, I know where to fetch from again. What do you think? No, we will come to that. Don't worry about the values yet. We're just asking the instructions. What are the instructions that are controlling you? That's all I'm asking. So is it a fixed set or is it a dynamic set? It should be static, right? Okay. So for a particular branch, the control independent set is actually a static set of instructions. Okay, right? So, which means I can remember it once I have discovered it. Right? And discovering it is also easy, depending on how the compiler behaves. For, a, for, for example, in MIPS, what will happen is that this branch um, will be a taken branch if the else part has to be executed. And at the end of the if part, there will be an unconditional jump, which will take you here, actually. Okay. So you can just look for these instructions. And you can easily find out what the control independent part is. That also answers the second question. How to find the reconvergence point? This is essentially this point. All right? And you can apply this to other branches also. For loops, while loops, all these things. The third question is, do we fetch all instructions and then look for these? Um, that is, do we fetch all these and then actually look for these instructions, which are control independent? Or we don't even fetch control dependent instructions until the branch outcome is known. What do we do actually? So there are two options, right? We can fetch everything sequentially, but don't do anything with this. Start executing from here. And wait until the branch outcome is known. In which case, I know which part to execute, and I can cancel the other part. The other option is, I skip over. I don't fetch anything. I fetch from here. And later, I'll fill in something, either this or this, when the branch outcome is known. Which one is easier, you think? Sorry? You should follow the first one. I should follow the first one, right? Because you have the data dependencies also. Okay. So there would be some data. Well, I am still not executing any of these, remember that. Because I don't know which one will execute ultimately. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about fetching part now. What should the fetcher do? Which one is easier? First part is easier, right? Why is the second part harder? Well, that would be my branch target. That would be my. Sorry? You don't know the reconvergence No, I can find out. Um, I look at the branch, right? Okay. Let's suppose it's, if, it's, if it's an FLS thing. I look at the branch, okay? So. Um, I know the taken target that I can compute because it's part of the instruction. Okay. I move one instruction up. If it's an unconditional jump, I then the target of that jump is a reconvergence point. I don't have to fetch anything actually. I can just inspect a couple of instructions and I'm done. But you need to inspect the, if, uh, all the instructions in that branch. No, I don't have to. I compute the target from the instruction. I go to the target. I move one instruction up. That's an unconditional jump. If it is an unconditional jump, yeah. then it, then that means it, it's an if-else construct. Mm -hmm. okay. And the target of the jump is essentially my reconvergence point. But then you need to the, you know, slots afterwards. Right, exactly. That's that's a very difficult thing to do. You have to you have to create space somewhere in the middle. Because see, this order is important. Because a map table has to maintain this order. 
because allocation has to happen in this order. So that's very difficult. It's easier to remove a structure from the queue, but filling in something in the middle is not that easy. Okay. So the first one is easier, okay, but of course it wastes space in your queue. The, you may fill up the queue with many unnecessary instructions. That's the bad thing. Okay. You said you are fetching the instructions after that, and you are not executing them. No. Often like I cannot because I don't know which one to execute. Actually. No, the instructions after the end. Yes, I'm executing everything. Yes, I'm executing all these. So, but then you need to figure out the data. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Yes, that's the last question. Yes. So these are called lightning values. The values that are needed to execute the reconvergence. So what do I do with this? Exactly that's what we were pointing out previously. That there may be a value which is produced here and also produced here. Which one should I take? First of all, I don't even execute any of these. Okay. What happens to this instruction? So the point is that the easy, easy way to figure this out is that you don't execute the instructions which are data dependent on anything here. Okay. So you hope to find something that is independent. Okay. So essentially now we're talking about not only control independence, we're also talking about data independence. Okay. So looking for instructions here that are control independent and data independent. Okay, those only the ones we can execute. Anyway, so um, so this one is just uh, um, so this is actually uh, you know uh, something that, that people have looked at um, as a research problem. Um, often works pretty well actually. Yes. 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 Right. Yeah. Yes, so, yes, exactly. So if you, if you have the second strategy that is you skip over all these things, yes, then figuring out data dependence is going to be very difficult. Yes, in fact, it may not be possible. Yes. 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 Yes.